This week on Barbell Shrug, we talk about how to pump up your training volume. Coffee. <laughs> I thought you were just eating the beans. Uh, I ate all the coffee. We're live. I ate all the coffee. Welcome to Barbell Shrugged, episode 95. I'm your host, Mike Blitzo, with my co hosts and best friends, Doug Larson and Chris hey, man, Moore. Thanks for that. You guys been rather CTP affectionate behind today, the hasn't camera. He? I love you too. It's because I, uh, we've all been traveling a lot. We haven't got to see each other very much. And uh, yeah, before we got the show started, I just had to share with my friends how much I appreciate them. So. It made me feel good. Made, I made Doug feel good. On the inside. Empathy and compassion, man. Real quick. Na- namaste. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> today we're going to be talking about uh, strength volume. He, he doesn't know what that means. Oh, he does. Strength volume, all right? <laughs> all I know is I say it at the end of the yoga session. <laughs> Like, Namaste nah. and shit. Thank you, Teach. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for stretching me out. My chakras. <laughs> uh, Chakra I, just, just, y'all want to get this out of there. We're talking about strength volume today? We will get to it eventually. <laughs> First, uh, go to barbellstrug.com, sign up for the newsletter. We're going to teach you about the eight snatch mistakes you might be making. Before we go any further on the actual content, content, where you're going to learn something, I just want to say, I went to the American Open last week, last weekend, and it was awesome. I had a great time. I got to hang out with people like Kendrick Ferris, John North, Travis Mash, Kanye West, Diane Fu, Justin Thacker, Christmas Abbott. Yes, I, I saw Kanye West in concert. It was, it was a dope. It was pretty cool. Yeah, I had a very full weekend. I hung out with some awesome people. Uh, one of the people I just listed off, Travis Mash, who I'd never met before, got to have uh, lunch with him one day. Man, we just hit it off, had a great time. Uh, ended up going to a party that night, and uh, I think I think one of our next episodes will be Travis Mash here in, in Travis. very near future. <clears throat> really? We're going to be traveling to North Carolina to hang out with him. When I was at the peak of my powerlifting years, he was one of the best lifters around. He was like a new Ed Cohen type guy. Great, great, great efficient lifter. So I'm excited about that. Yeah. I also met a little girl, L. Farr. Yeah? That's not her first name is L. That's what she... her. Like she E-L-E. goes by E L L E. Yep, her last name is Far. She's Glamorous she's name. really really cool. She came up. Her and her dad came and talked. Uh, Russ uh, and they came and talked to me. And uh, she does jujitsu and CrossFit and so awesome. I don't exactly remember how old she was, but it's really cool talking to her because she you could tell that she was like really interested in everything going on. She followed all the CrossFit people, all the weightlifting people. <laughs> you could tell she was really bright and. Uh, because she liked you. <laughs> she likes Obviously. me too. So she's really, she knows where talent is. She, she's got a good eye. If you agree with me, I think you're smart. <laughs> well, she went around and took pictures with like with you and John North and, and oh, Kendrick yeah. and, and everyone. Yeah. yeah. I, would, I wouldn't have had the balls to do that when I was 12 no. and 12. That's awesome. When I was a kid, I would be terrified. Uh, I'd be very intimidated. But she was really bright. I talked to her a few times over the weekend. I really enjoyed it. So if I see you again, Elle, uh, come and say hi again. And it's so awesome to see a new Dawn, a new era, if you will, where little girls are idolizing weightlifters. I, I never thought I'd see that. It's so it is awesome, crazy, dude. yeah, yeah. It's ridiculously awesome. And Times uh, they be changing. If you want to hear exactly what went, went on that weekend, I think I was on the Weightlifting Talk podcast for maybe a total of three or four hours. So split into two different episodes. And you can find that on Spreaker. Just look up. And uh, you Weightlifting have a Talk. whole episode about it on your brand spanking new awesome podcast. Yes. What's up, yeah? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I actually did talk about it a little bit. I was really worn down, and I, I wouldn't advise listening to that episode. 
No, but uh, go listen to Weightlifting Talk. We great commercial for your show. <laughs> <laughs> my show sucks. <laughs> you should check it out. <laughs> it's basically just the sound of my beard rubbing against the microphone for forty five minutes. Just You'll like enjoy this. it if you want to. Yeah, if you want to yeah. be introduced some new tunes and uh, some of my ideas on life in general, Bledsopia is the podcast you should check out. So there's your one. <laughs> yes. Uh, but I got to hang out with some awesome people. There were some moments where I'm staying in a circle of like, you know, a lot of the younger weightlifting coaches, and we were having really awesome discussions about the future of weightlifting. It was a really exciting weekend. There was more people registered for this weightlifting meet than any weightlifting meet in the world. It was like I think we broke a world record. It was four was it 453 people were registered for the American Open this year? They didn't know what to do uh, with everybody. Uh, Spoon Barbell put on the meat. They did a fantastic job of managing it because it was no, it was a lot was of bad. chaos. The weather was bad. How many people showed? Oh, All that? There, was a, there was quite a few people who didn't didn't show, and I actually think that might have helped the meat yeah. go a little bit smoother because it was That's bad. a gigantic weight lift. I'm talking meat, started man. early on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday and went into the you know late hours. You like know. I've been up half the meat. The latest one I ever saw, one year at the... Um, IP Nationals, I lifted. My flight ended for the deadlift at like 11.45 p.m. When we quit, let, we quit deadlift. Oh, man. That's how, and we it's started, exhausting, We man. started like at 9.45 and the way the way I showed up. The way powerlifting works is different than weightlifting because you're done in two hours. In powerlifting, it's all day long. It's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's too spread out. out. I don't like it. Yeah, and, it, and it's all this intense. Like It's it's 12 hours of rah, 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 oh, come over loudspeakers <laughs> and bald guys with goatees being way too aggressive it's with way, each other. Yeah, heavy heavy metal for 12 hours straight. It gets, it gets mm-hmm. phrased the nerves. By the time you get the deadlift, you just want to go home. Yeah, four hours in between events is way too long. <laughs> yes. All right, let's get on to the topic at hand. Now that we've talked about the American Open, powerlifting, all that mess. So what was the original question that spurred this show? Uh, what man, spurred actually, you? Actually didn't copy it down. You know, somebody was asking, uh, at, you know, qu- asking for how to adjust volume, increase volume for beginners. So someone who's starting in training, how do we adjust the volume? Where do you start with the volume? So today we're, we're specifically talking about how to adjust volume for strength. And then maybe we'll come back another day and do a, an episode on how to adjust volume for they, your conditioning. The nitty gritty of how to add work, right? How to get better at doing work. Yeah, we're, get, uh, we're getting into the... Conditioning and strength are a little bit different. So, yeah, we need to address just the strength today, and then maybe on uh, the next episode we'll do conditioning. Mm-hmm. So why is adjusting training volume important then? For progress, Doug. We all want to <laughs> get better. Yeah. So you got to embrace change if, in your if, heart. If you're that person that has a hard time just walking up the stairs, uh, obviously walking up two flights of stairs is better than and then, uh, walking up one flight of stairs yesterday. <laughs> that's progress. And when should that person start two-a-days? yeah it's uh you know in uh when i was in college we had this class where we had to uh talk we were were coming up with (laughs) they made us talk they made us talk it was was terrible (laughs) but we we had to come up with like these these discussions like if we were to go on the news or something and discuss something Mm -hmm. what would it be what do these people need to hear in this this one you're gonna be a pundit this hunting tree yeah this one girl was like i would talk about the risks of overtraining. And I'm like, no. Oh, great. Thank <laughs> like, you. This is not. The point zero 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 one percent of athletes need to hear about that. More than likely, <laughs> nobody is overtraining that you're talking Listen to. Listen up, America. You could be doing too much work. <laughs> 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 Said no one ever. <laughs> no one recognizes that as a problem. But it does happen in CrossFit. People, uh, I wouldn't say they're, they're overtraining in their volume overall. I think frequently they, they train too high a volume in a very small, uh, I guess, domain. I yeah, guess Too much of one thing yeah, and, and too, a whole lot of not a bunch of other things yeah, they that they need do, to be doing. They either do too much That's weightlifting or they do more than likely what the case is. They're doing too much conditioning or they're doing too much long conditioning, not enough short conditioning, not enough speed work. So there's, mm-hmm. a, there's a lot of variables there. And it's important. To uh, not overtrain a specific area, but more than likely the total volume is not that high. Yeah, the easy thing to do as a beginner is to come in, do blog programming, just metcon all the time, strength train maybe once or twice a week, uh, and then eventually you kind of get sick of metconning, realize that strength is your limiter, and then you kind of backtrack. I can get on a regular strength program. That that seems to be the kind of the the standard de- development or stage stages of development that I see with brand new CrossFitters. Yeah, I think it's because when people discover CrossFit all the time, the Metcon is just, that's what's so different and so fun. And, and you're right. sexy, right? Yeah, you're right. Like, it doesn't take very long. You get, 
so mm-hmm. good at, at the conditioning aspect and all of a sudden what, what is limiting you is your strength you it know, does seem to be the thrusters does seem to be the the psychological hook for new crossfitters even if that's not ultimately what they need to be doing is just metconning every day if you want to get someone started on crossfit just let them metcon a whole bunch <laughs> they'll get plenty of progress on really just quick, doing that quick progress satisfying yeah, progress. they'll get some quick progress <laughs> though they'll get the experience of, of really pushing themselves to the limit which a lot of people just simply aren't used to doing and they'll be like this is super super fun and then they'll keep doing it and then it, they have to go through that that process of metconning too much realizing they're not making progress in the in the long run because their strength isn't high enough and then they'll cycle back on their own from having that experience and then they'll decide that they need to focus it's on the calibration strength calibration process yeah and you you don't get there until you've had the experience so it, it, you know, we, we do this all the time on the show. We try to convince you you need more strength. And the people that have had that experience are like, yeah, that's what everyone needs to hear. And the people that haven't had that experience don't listen to you at all because they don't they don't understand. They don't have any perspective on why that's important. So if you're a very unique person, you could probably skip. You probably skip that phase and go, OK, well, I don't need to worry about my conditioning and I can just start on mostly strength and some conditioning. But most people need to have the experience of, of doing it wrong first before they'll backtrack and focus on strength in the beginning yeah, the latter is more likely unless you're coming from a strength sport already <laughs> right and I, I think that actually doing metcons is, is a way to like get that initial volume i mean if you're doing you know really light front squats in, in a conditioning session that's probably a great it's, thing it's if, pra- you, if you're not practice. someone who squats a lot so yeah. lots of practice on a new thing it's a great way to get a lot of reps in so and and it's a lot of fun so it can be a good way to kind of intro mm-hmm. even though you may feel like you're focusing on conditioning if you do a lot of thrusters at 95 pounds and your best front squats you know 165 pounds mm-hmm. you're technically don't, you're almost there at strength work yeah, beginners can make good strength gains off as low as 40% of their max. When, yeah. If you are truly brand new to, to any type of weight training. If you've already been doing other types of lifting, if you come out of bodybuilding or powerlifting or weightlifting, well, you're, you don't, you're not in that category. If you are just playing brand new to training, you've been sitting on the couch for 10 years, then you don't have to go in and, and lift you know, five sets of triples on, you can do on back anything. squats. You can just, yeah, you can just, you can just metcon and, you can and get stronger. It won't matter. It won't matter yeah. for like months probably. You could pick up medicine balls and set them down and probably get better. Right. So in the beginning, you don't need a progression. If you are truly brand new, you don't need a progression. You just need to train. Get used to doing work. That's it. And so just starting is more volume for you, right? Yeah. <laughs> just work, in, working out at all is way more volume than doing nothing. I think people need to go, okay, I'm going to train three times a day or three times a week. And then your next step shouldn't be like, well, what reps and sets and how much weight should it be? It should be maybe you should just try to train four days a week at that point. Yeah. And I'll then think, five days a week. And then once mm-hmm. you get to four and five days a week, that's probably when you need to start really considering those progressions, what you're talking about. I think the about. simplest mm-hmm. way to describe it is you, you get in shape to then train. Like you, you prepare yourself for what comes later, which is this, this more regimented thing that, you know, once you've sort of polished off all the big chunky edges, now you start doing the refined work where you're, you're counting more often and the math is more important. And that's actually a, a, one of the big arguments that CrossFit's been making for a long time. If you like check out the CrossFit Journal, they talk about GPP, mm-hmm. general, general physical preparedness. And people, a lot of coaches, if you look at like a lot of sports specific coaches, football, you know, there's people that are doing speed training or something like that. It, a lot of times the GPP is not there. And if you just raise the GPP, everything else rises with it. And I think a lot of times people are too quick to move out of a GPP program and move into something that's sports specific or they're they're trying to improve this one little aspect of their fitness when if they just get better general physical preparedness, the whole potential rises. That goes mm-hmm. for advanced athletes too. Like I know of football teams now they're starting to dabble with things like CrossFit. They're not doing anything fancy. They're just doing basic, like when you when you play football, you do one kind of thing for so long, so intensely, like the same strength and conditioning type approach with the sprints and the lifting and the the bad power cleans. And these guys have been doing that for so many years that at some point for them, you, you get a big benefit from going back and being a beginner again and just doing thing like a guy who's been playing in NFL for five years, get you a big bang for his buck by learning how to do just the most basic crossfit movements because he's he's doing a whole lot of new things on underdeveloped qualities. Yeah, it's like I, new for him. He's yeah, a he, beginner in this regard. And, he, and this work, the simplest thing does him the best good. Even if you're not, I mean, in getting outside of that, so for football players, you know, they need to be really strong and fast for 10 seconds. You know, I think a lot of people get caught up in that, you know, we need to train for those 10 seconds. It's like, 
it might be beneficial to do a 10 minute Metcon for that guy. He may raise his, his potential in this other aspect of fitness. If he just focuses over here for a little while, he's not doing something so hard either. He's just moving for 10 minutes intensely, but not beating himself up, which is all he ever has experienced in his competitive yeah. career and training career. I do think you're spot on about adding days per week first. Yeah. Uh, what we do at, at Faction is we put people through a four week fundamentals course where it's three days a week. So it's three days a week for four weeks and then we tell them to start the regular classes and then they, they're kind of up to their own at that point. They can, they can do five days a week or, or two days a week or whatever, whatever fits their schedule. But what we recommend for them is to stick with three days a week because the regular classes at our facility are going to be more volume than the fundamentals classes already. So that's, that's an increase in and of itself, even though it's still three days a week. Yep. And then we recommend they do two days on, one day off, two days on, one day off. And then once they start to not be so sore, uh, they're, they're sleeping just fine. They feel like they they hand, they are handling that volume just fine. Usually we tell them maybe another three or four weeks at that volume. Then we tell them to bump up to either two days on one day off, three days on one day off, and they alternate back and forth between those two or just to go straight to three days on one day off, which is kind of like the standard CrossFit recommendation. Mm -hmm. That way they're training most days of the week. If you're training less than five days a week, then getting to at least five days a week probably is the very first thing that you should be shooting for. You don't have to skip to it right now, but that's what you should be building to first. I think you touched on a really important point, which was uh, sleep and recovery. And I think a lot of times people are quick to to increase their training volume when they haven't mastered recovery yet. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times people are, you know, they want to get more results. So they want to inc improve like, the results by improving mm -hmm. their volume. Minimum effective dose and then dose response and recovery. You got to keep that in mind. It's not the work. It's getting over the work. Yeah. That makes you better. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're not getting, if you're getting five, six hours of sleep a night, going from four days a week to five days a week of training is probably not your next best step. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's getting eight hours of sleep a night and eating high quality foods. So just keep yeah. that in mind as we, as we talk about this, you know, adding volume may not be the next best answer for you. Yeah. If you're a more advanced athlete, granted this show is kind of catering to beginners, but if you're a more advanced athlete, your program should probably, probably be the last thing that you change. Right. You should be making sure everything else in your life is, is on point and you're recovering to, to your full extent or, or to recover as best as possible, whatever that means for you. And then changing your program is the last thing you should do. Yeah. I don't know how many times I've had athletes, you know, I, I've got say, for instance, 20 athletes on a, on a training program and 19 of them are make, you're getting stronger. They're getting faster. They're breaking records. And then, uh, you got the one walks over is like, I think there's something wrong with the program. <laughs> He's usually the one not sticking to it. <laughs> it's funny. Like, <laughs> but, but, there, but then I go, well, how much you sleep in the night? Are you getting high quality food? We're like, well, this thing came up in my life. I'm like, okay, the program's the last thing we're going to talk about today. And my, my girlfriend blew up in a fireworks accident, but I, I wanted the friend time, man. I had this thing in my mind, like get that time. I hate it when that happens. Those <laughs> yeah. firework ex accidents, uh, you know. Oh, they were cheap and you know water damage. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I had a point. I was going to say something so important. I'm like, well, I got the fireworks thing came on my mind. <laughs> All right. So once we're training five days a week and, you know, and, and we're showing up and we've got our recovery mastered, mm. you know, what's what's our yearly plan look like? Are you can have fluctuations based on competitions or. So assuming you're a, a guy who wants to, or guy or girl who <laughs> wants to compete. Sorry, ladies. I almost <laughs> left you out. Uh, They're like, Wait that, a minute. Oh. Okay, Doug, this time, man. Doug, Doug <laughs> tends to do that. Very sexist. <laughs> Ladies, I'll never leave you out, I promise. <laughs> we don't trust that so, bit, though. Good luck. Assuming you want to compete in the open and you are basically treating this like a sport and you have a season, which is usually kind of that, that March, April, May, maybe beyond that if you do really well, uh, you want to cycle your training volume over time. So uh, we'll talk about kind of how we do it on a monthly basis and how we can even do that on a weekly basis here in a second, but... Uh, for the most part, after the Open or the Regionals or whenever your season is over, then you're starting to ramp up your strength volume. And it's gonna it's probably going to peak late in the year, around November, December, maybe January, depending on how much strength you need to gain. And then your strength volume might go down a little bit and you're going to start ramping up your, your conditioning volume in the probably 12 weeks out from, uh, from the Open yeah, or this Regionals. Is, this is something that uh, one of the big differences between I just want to look good naked training and uh, I'm preparing for competition. Oh, you, just, you know, this annual competition. You know, what you just reminded me of 
What's R- Rip a toes article. You want to talk? One of the, the good, the bad, and ugly of CrossFit. You said I didn't read the whole thing. To be honest, <clears throat> but everybody likes to throw these out there because it stirs up a lot of shit. But one of them is sure. that. Hey, listen, everybody. Okay, you need to understand that CrossFit is exercise. And training is training. And most of these guys who are really impressive at CrossFit, they're actually training. They don't even do CrossFit. This is, I hear it a lot. That's a, the that's a criticism people make of CrossFit is that it's just exercise. What we're talking about here is how, for a lot of people, that's exactly what you need more than anything is exercise. It's, right. It's motion. It's movement. It's accumulation of, of general movement patterns and work. And that, yeah, there's a time for doing the training, which comes after you've gotten really good at exercising. You, know, you get in shape. <laughs> yeah, I just want to throw it out. Like, if you're it's not the most obvious thing, it's true. Yeah, if you're not training for a specific competition or a season, then your training might look different. You might have a more even balance between strength it's okay. and conditioning throughout the year. And for me personally, I I prefer that type of training mm-hmm. because it doesn't beat me up so much. You don't get into these deep valleys and and peaks and stuff like that, and you feel more. Exercise you know, is not a dirty word. More man. stable throughout the year. So, yeah, I definitely prefer exercising to training. But once you get to training, like Doug was saying, you know, there's parts of the year where there's a big focus on strength. And then there's these big variations. And to change gears can be painful sometimes. And, and the potential for injury there is really high, too. Mm-hmm. So what about each month? So a, a mesocycle, the fancy word for that. Ooh. Usually we do four week blocks. We call it mesocycles. Hashtag, holy shit. Doug said a word people might not know. The year long was a macro cycle. The four week block is a mesocycle. And then the weekly ones are micro cycles. When did we start right? educating people? I this know. is crazy. It's craziness. So <laughs> usually we do four week blocks. What do those four week blocks look like for the most part? Just talking about volume. Just volume. How's it fluctuate from week to week? What do the little bars look like? Like a butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, the volume thing is hard to talk about. It's definitely easier if you have a visual representation, which you can see a visual representation if you signed up for uh, the six month <laughs> muscle gain uh, <laughs> or, or for the Red Regionals. Like we, the launch videos, the videos that we had that were informative mm-hmm. to teach you about that, you can go to those pages and uh, we put together webinars where we explain that. So it, it's not, you can go look at those. Is that your answer to that? Yes, 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 you I'm can. Not, but what, <laughs> the like, the we're doing a show. So people want to ask, like, what does it look like? Oh, don't go wor- online and search for a video. Don't what wor- do you want from us? Don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> I'm not excited to explain this shit. What are you talking about? About, right, the, so, about to answer my own softball question. So, so, <laughs> what have I been reduced to? All right, week, week one, you'll have, you know, low volume, lower volume. Uh, week two, medium volume. Week three, high volume. Right. And this what is, happens on week four? Oh, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> I forgot. And week three, this is where you might start <laughs> feeling beat up. This is where you don't feel real. You may not feel your best and all that. And then week four is a deload. Or what, as Chris, unload. As Chris, as Chris likes God. to say, unload. Because uh, <laughs> he said there's no such word as deload. But uh, during that deloading week. Hey, can you help me deload the truck? No, I can't, weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is that supposed to mean? <laughs> Uh, so yes, uh, the computer will try to will try to tell you that deload is not a real word when you when you type it out. I've Fuck, learned that. Like Microsoft knows what they're talking about. <clears throat> yeah, they're a bunch of nerds. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no nerds gonna tell me how to live my life. So the fourth week, you know, you go from you build up this progression. You have you know lighter volume, medium volume, high volume. And then on the fourth week, that's where you actually adapt. You know, you take a break. You're still doing the movements. You're still doing about half as much as you did in that third week. And But that's your time to rest. That's when, you know, you, you might go into the deload week, unload week, feeling a little beat up. By the end of it, you should feel really good and ready to start ramping back and up. And it's not set in stone. You could do two peaks to make yourself a little bit more tired and take two weeks of down to kind of play with how you respond and see for you for the sake of knowing when you peak and how you peak best, play with those. You could, you could, maybe three weeks is enough. Maybe five works for you better. Yeah. You could go six. There's I no find, golden rule. I find younger athletes can go five, six weeks without that unloading week. That's not and you and me. And maybe. older guys, like two weeks. So after two weeks, sometimes we're I'm old I'm meat, like, man. We're tough. We're gristly. That's not us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was going to say also, I would, I would share another. So there's that classic ramp, uh, easy, moderate, heavy, and that's when the fatigue starts and you drop and then you get a, the balance. That's the classic great thing that works most of the time for most people. When I was powerlifting, my favorite thing to do is actually a little bit of a tweak. And Jim Miller recommends a similar thing in 531 for powerlifting. So he makes the same switch, which I thought was amazing because he found the same thing independently, which means 
we must like totally found something worth like you know writing down. And, and he must be a genius. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so it's actually week one is a is the medium. Week two is like a light, like right. a speed week. Okay. Primed week, and you go really heavy, and then you you rest. So it's like a it's a, it's a slight dip than a ramp. Yeah, you see that with some. It's more like, traditional than what I've done over the years. Yeah, yeah I, like medium, very high, high. Like uh, and then I think I remember low. Dr. Andy Gap and I used to really talk about like like hit it really hard. And then rest and recover and do like a speed week where everything needs to be exposed as possible and then come back up and then crush what you did the week one. Yeah. yeah. You see a lot of weightlifting programs that do that. It's it's a you know moderate, light, yeah, you get, like, heavy you get as a hell, momentum bump. And right? then and then yeah. you take your deload. Yeah. Yeah. So you can get really complicated or you can just And it works really good. Ramp you, up and I think it works deload. best when you need a break from the constant like you've been doing like four week blocks for a year of the same ramp up and down. It's a good just change. I don't think that's a problem for most people. All right. So we took something that was very easy to follow and we, we added a bunch of examples. Now it probably sounds confusing. So <laughs> uh, so let's back up to the original example. You you basically ramped up, you did one week here, one week here, one week here, and then you had a deload week. So maybe you did three sets of five. And then four sets of five the next week, and then five sets of five, and then that deload week. Maybe you just did one tester, you hit a five RM, right? And then you were done. Yeah, actually, so one really, set of five basically. Yeah, that's exactly how I like to do it right now. A lot of times is is just that you know find let that deload be, week be when you look for that new five rep max or something that. like that. So but usually you're resting in at the end of your deload week. That's when you're testing. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So you were saying something similar, but but slightly different. So using that same uh, you know sets of five. Example, like how would you do the the example you well, used? You could use? start with like a good, hard, tough three by five session, mm -hmm. and then you could do a session where maybe you did like three by three or like four by two, well, like you know, on week two. Yeah, like the, this less work, but you know, uh, maybe with the focus being moving a little quicker and like you know, uh, but week four or oh, three, then you could do like a five by five week, a really tough week, mm -hmm. and then you got week four to recover. So you can do a little more on that hard week if you do that. Like there's a little bit less of a of a cumulative where like you can hit it really hard, acute and strong in week three if you do that like that way. So for you to, to oversimplify this, in your example, you're going up, 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 down, down. Right. up, 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 down. And in your example, you're going kind of up, down, up, down, up, down. But every fourth week, the down is a little bit more down. Yeah. And then more the highs, down, more down the highs in the second get, week. And then highs, you can get yeah. a little higher. You know, it's a little bit, you know, more spiky. That yeah. makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So if we use the same example, it might be like three sets of five. And then five sets of five, and then four sets of five, and then two sets of five. Does that make sense? No, you I kind think, of medium, coffee ran out there. very high, <laughs> high, and then low. Yeah, and then a medium, a very high, high, high yeah. and then low. Okay, so that's what month, that's what monthly looks like. You you can do a million different variations within that little uh, that little system or that or within and that concept, but but the, really the no easiest way, way it, yeah. easiest way is just to go. Up, 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 down, deload, up, 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 deload. Yeah, the, however you want to think about the, that. You know, the principle is is that you ramp up and then you deload, ramp up and deload. That's never going to change. What can change is, is, you know, week to week, like what you were talking about. What can also change is the duration. You don't have to do three weeks and then the fourth week. It can go five weeks, six weeks. You might need it after two weeks. Yeah, There's, I think it's really important to keep like that. You got to be very observant and write a lot of things down, take a lot of notes, collect a lot of data for yourself. Like when you add a week, if you go from three to four or four to five, you extend things, you shorten things, you get, you pay attention to how long it takes you to warm up, how your strength is responding, how you feel, how you're recovering, you know, your, your perceived soreness. Like you got to keep notes of all this so you know, okay, for me, you know, it really does look like three is, it works, seems to work a whole lot better. And that's how you start right. getting into the real data. Like no one can tell you Exactly, all these potential possibilities we're describing. No one can tell you exactly which one's optimal. There's no such thing as like a perfect one of these things. Right. You play and you get okay. I really like this pattern. It seems to work for me. I'm making good progress. And you and sort it, of it can change. Say you start getting more sleep, or you change your diet, and you yeah. start getting more calories. It's just not. Then you might be able thing. to go another week before you deload or something like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. So, yeah. especially for beginners, we I just use the example of four week blocks, but. Beginners might not need to do a four week block. They might not, not, not need to deload every fourth week because they're not as beat up as some of these more advanced athletes might be right, yeah. during that fourth week. They might be able to go six weeks or eight weeks before they really need a deload week. Yeah. Uh, and another thing I like to mention as well is, you know, if you're feeling, if an athlete comes to me and goes, oh my God, I feel like I'm about to, this is, I'm really being pushed mentally here. I'm like, well, it's the fifth day of the third week and deload starts tomorrow. Go ahead and hit this training session as hard as you can, you know, and then next week you'll get to recover. If that same athlete comes to me in the middle of week one 
there's a problem. <laughs> That's when we know we, we probably dug the hole too deep uh, and we overreached a little too far. Weak. And you need to get them out of your gym. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what? You can't take the training. You're not good enough. Leave. Leave this place and never come back. He, he's joking, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping I was cut carrying. Let me hold my quotation. I don't know. Yeah. I'm being serious. The voice of someone who's never owned a gym. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Disregard everything I say. <laughs> uh, Chris, what do you like to what do you like to change? Sets, reps. What is your way of increasing or decreasing volume? I mean, we were talking about the the example was three sets of five, four sets of five, five sets of five. Do you like to stick stick with sets of five, or how do you like to change things around? I think I'd rather add more. I tend to add more days than <clears throat> sets and reps. Like I usually work up as quickly as possible something that's really heavy, like for squats. So instead of going like instead of three sets of five, go to five sets of five. Well, usually I always work up to a single, or double or triple, and I'll just add days when I want to do more work. So instead of doing it two days a week, I'll go to three days for squatting. And then when I really want to do work, maybe in the summer when I'm feeling better and the days are longer and I'm eating a little more food and everything's more optimal, I can try to squat maybe five days a week. So I would say I had frequency, not, not sets, uh, like in one workout because I found it easier to recover from. So with adding something like, like more days a week of squatting, <clears throat> you're not building up to a five RM five days a week. No, no. Like I, I believe in doing as much as you can in the most balanced way possible. So when I'd add a day, like Let's say I do a back squat on day one. <clears throat> you know, day two, if I want to squat like on Wednesday, if, if I'm going from one, Monday to Friday to Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the workout I would add in the middle of the week would be the easiest thing to recover from. So that's a perfect day to add like a front squat because if I'm still tired from back squats, I get tired in a little different way for front squats. So I'd add the easiest thing to recover from. So like I'll add a lot of front squat work if I want to up the volume because it's hard for me because mechanically I have a tough time being vertical and working that position but for that same reason i don't get too beat up so i can add more and ensure i can recover from it yeah i think there you'll see something like that in a lot of weightlifting programs too yeah. you'll see monday wednesday saturday you know you're doing the full snatch you know the squat snatch and you're doing a squat clean and jerk but on tuesdays and thursdays you're doing a power clean power snatch you're still practicing the movements but uh the the total volume that you're doing is lower for one you're going to do lighter weight with a power snatch or, or a power clean versus the squat and the, yeah, I think the range Glenn, of motion is different. I think Glenn is good at doing that, Glenn Finley. So you, you, if you look at a, a group of lifters, you say, those guys always max out. That's one, that's one thing you're seeing. They're doing as much weight on an exercise as possible. But the type of exercise is so important because if you go from doing, you know, if every day you did clean and jerks to max twice, it'd be really tough. But yeah. if you do clean and jerk to max day one and then like a high hang clean, to a max day, day two or three or whatever you do a lot less weight on one it's quote, quotation marks max effort for you but you can recover from it better maxing out a lot so like different movements it's not this idea people have about bulgarian training where it's like every day you show up to the gym and you lift heavy barbell no excuse no walk away no no life after a barbell no that was fucking shit <laughs> it's too intense right but you can go heavy all the time on exercises that are tougher so you're not, you're not getting so beat up from it it's so a yeah. very important detail to understand. All right, so if I wanted to get bigger and stronger, what, how would the reps look for that version, or bigger? 10 by how, 10 German the, volume the, training. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, that, that doesn't not work. That's exactly what I was about to say. That's exactly what I was about to say. a great way of describing it, right? It doesn't <laughs> not work. Yeah. yeah, it's not the funnest training in the world. But, uh, you know, if you want to get bigger, does how do the reps and sets work? For that versus you want to stay the same size and get stronger. How, how would you change that, Doug? Getting bigger versus just getting stronger and not getting bigger at the same time. Right. So you could play that game two ways. The The training could differ or maybe it, maybe it could not differ and you could just change your diet. But some people, when they're trying to get big or get, or get small, they might keep their training the same and just adjust their diet. In one case, they gain muscle mass and get a little bigger. In one case, they lose a little bit of body fat and get smaller. That's super common in my case. If I'm training for an MMA fight, usually off season, I'm trying to get as big and strong as possible. And then when a fight approaches, my training pretty much stays the same. I'm trying to stay as strong and as explosive as possible leading up to the fight. I suggest my diet and then I make weight. Yeah. So you don't necessarily have to change your training program, um, but um, changing your diet is a, is a huge factor there. So yeah. uh, if you're a beginner, like I said at the very beginning of the podcast, uh, 
training with as little as 40% of your max can still help you get stronger. So sticking with the kind of the hypertrophy or the bodybuilding rep ranges, if you're doing back squats for, you know, four sets of eight or three sets of 10 or whatever is this kind of cliche as that is. And we make fun of that a little bit. Um, not because it doesn't work, just because we like to, you know, poke fun at like the old ways of doing things, even though kind of like uh, you guys were just saying those ways still work. So uh, if you're a new person sticking with something like three sets of 10 will still work. So you can do those hypertrophy rep ranges and, and get really good progress off of it. You don't necessarily have to jump to like three, five sets of three heavy uh, to gain body weight. You can do lighter weights uh, as strength training. Yeah, I think athletes can see years of results from that in the beginning. You know, it, not not increasing, you know, increasing the reps, you know, in that eight to 12 rep range. And if you want to increase you know, more, if you want to raise the volume, add another set of eight to 12, mm -hmm. you know, maybe we don't want to drop below eight reps per set and we can go pretty high on the reps and increase the volume that yeah, way. If you're going to make mm -hmm. a bad mistake is that you start adding too much weight too soon before you do you, the work, before you put in the, the effort. Yeah. With, with, with <laughs> a more advanced base. athlete, I would prefer to, to add volume by adding, uh, you know, the sets mm -hmm. instead of the reps, maybe keep the reps say at three we're gonna do three squats mm -hmm. you know we may do five sets of three today and then we're gonna do seven sets of three next week and the next week nine sets of three or something like that mm -hmm. and so you know the more advanced athlete and the athlete that doesn't want to gain mm -hmm. as much weight maybe they're not looking to be in a hypertrophy phase i prefer to do it that way that's my favorite food, way sorry. to add volume for kind of like the big bilateral movements for for heavy cleans deadlifts squats i like adding more sets less reps like you're saying yeah. so stick between kind of three and six or three and eight um, three sets of, oh, excuse me, three reps to eight reps per set for those, the big lifts, so to speak. Yeah. And then for the hypertrophy rep ranges, like I was just talking about, I like to do that for like the assistance movements for, for things like lunges and yeah. glute ham raises, overhead, strict overhead pressing, things like that, yeah. especially for beginners. So cheesy. All right, let's take a break real quick. When we come back, we're going to talk about how we can actually put all these program stuff together. Are we going to whisper the second half of this show? Are we going to whisper? Oh, we're going to talk about it. <laughs> uh, welcome back to the Daily BS. My name is Doug Larson with the Barbell Shrug Podcast. Michael Bless is right over there, looking excited. Uh, today's question is all about meal prep and how to make your busy life uh, a little bit easier to manage by having all your food prepared ahead of time. So, a few strategies there. Uh, number one, I like to uh, systematically shop once a week. I shop every single Sunday. Uh, that way, every Sunday, it's the same trip to the grocery store over and over and over. I know exactly how much food I need to get through the week because I shop every seven days, uh, pretty much every week, occasionally, um, six days or eight days, but pretty much every Sunday, I shop and uh, I go home. I take all my food. I don't just shove it in the fridge and forget about it. Uh, I take a lot of it and usually I cook right then. I take everything I'm going to cook, I put it on the counter, and then I take everything that I'm going to cook later in the week and I put that in the fridge. That way I don't put everything in the fridge and forget about it. Uh, that way I can, I can prepare a couple of large meals right then and there. Uh, and then anything that I want to use throughout the week, like if I want to cut up a big pineapple or cut up a bunch of vegetables for other meals throughout the week, um, I can just uh, prepare all those, put them in Tupperware where they're all diced up and ready for uh, any future meals over the next couple of days. Uh, that way, you know, I wake up in the morning and I want to have breakfast. I want to have pineapple with my breakfast. I don't have to cut open or cut up a pineapple when I'm tired right after I got out of bed. It's all cut up, ready to go. I can make my eggs and then just put a couple of uh, big chunks of pineapple on my plate or whatever fruit you want. So uh, prepping everything ahead of time right when you go home from the grocery store is a big tip. I generally cook big bulk meals Sundays, like I said, right after I go home from the grocery store. Uh, and then also, again, on Wednesdays. And those meals tend to be my my kind of lunchtime or just any time in the middle of the day meals. Generally, breakfast I make fresh every day except for the um, cut up fruit and vegetables that uh, I just talked about. But for the most part, I'll make some eggs, some bacon, uh, I'll cut up an avocado fresh and then I'll just put whatever diced up fruit and vegetables uh, I want. Um, I'll put those on my plate as well that I you know, usually prepare on Sundays and Wednesdays like I just talked about. And then dinner's the same thing. Um, I make dinner uh, pretty much fresh every night. I'll cook a steak and then I'll make either a salad or some type of a, a blender smoothie with, with spinach and berries and nuts, flax seeds, and whatever else I decide to put in there. Um, but my middle of the day meals, I cook those in bulk on Sundays and Wednesdays. Um, that way, you know, when I'm working in the middle of the day and I don't want to take a whole lot of time off, but I'm hungry, I can just uh, go to the fridge, scoop up something, and uh, microwave it real quick, and I'm pretty much done. Uh, those Sunday, Wednesday meals, 
I generally like to cook a few things at the same time as well. So I'll usually make like a big crock pot, something like a chili or a stew. Uh, and then I can also at the same time, I can put a couple of pounds of meat in the oven and then I can be prepping my vegetables while those things are, are cooking. So I like to do a, a whole bunch of meals all at once, package it all up, put them in Tupperware, put it in the fridge and then I should be good to go for three or four days. And again, Sunday is Wednesday, so I do that twice a week. It's a pretty good routine for me. It makes it where I don't have to actually cook that much, but I always have good food available and prepared when I'm hungry, which is the most important thing if you're trying to eat well consistently. Any human on the planet, when they get hungry, they're gonna find food somewhere. And if you don't have good food available and prepared, then you're gonna go out to eat, you're gonna eat junk food, you're gonna eat whatever happens to be lying around. Someone's gonna say, you wanna order pizza? And you're gonna say, yeah, it sounds great because you know, you're just hungry and you gotta eat something. And if you're tired and <laughs> kinda out of willpower, then uh, then you're, you're not going to uh, want to cook a bunch of high quality food in the moment. So prepare it all ahead of time, Sundays and Wednesdays. If you have more questions about meal prep um, or what to eat, uh, two things. You can either um, go buy the Faction Foods Nutrition course. I talk about this topic uh, in a lot of depth in that course. Uh, or also you can always go to barbellshrug.com, click the ask a question tab at the top of the page, ask us more questions so we can do more daily BSs on them in the future or maybe even talk about them on the show. See you next time. Jason Khalifa, ladies and gentlemen, the 2008 Crossing Game Champion. Anthony. Shaka bro. Fired up. Welcome back. I'm here with Doug, Chris, and CTP. Your friends. My friends. <laughs> oh, I, I, you know what? I really want to say that uh, we're all friends because I did have someone come up to me at the American Open and it was really, really funny. And he goes, are Doug and Chris friends? <laughs> Why Chris, that? Chris Moore? Yeah, yeah. Well, what's somebody I say like, is that? I was like, I think, I think everyone recognizes that the two of you are so different from each other. <laughs> they were like, do they actually hang out? I was like, yeah, we all hang out. We're yeah, all friends. Like, There's no way those guys like each other. So yeah, there was, it was funny because <laughs> I was like, it never occurred to me that we wouldn't all be friends, but I guess yeah. some people out there think that maybe we just meet up, do the show, and oh, then we're like, right. we go our separate ways and like, fuck those guys. But well, no, we all hang mm -hmm. out. We were hanging out last night. We had a good time. Right. So just want to throw that out there because well, it was Paul a Paul Abdul said it best, opposites attract, and that's true in this case. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, and I, Doug and I have a very intimate relationship, actually, <laughs> to the to people who would question our relationships. Very intimate, very kind and loving. We go to each other's houses. We we hang out. Yeah, there's not, so. you don't see anything fake here. I mean, yeah. you know, we're growing it out. It, was, it just it just really blew my mind when, when, when he asked. I was like, why would... Why would you think otherwise? Well, people can probably feel like when Doug's like, Chris, shut the fuck up. And his brain energy is sending out that kind of... <laughs> yeah, that's probably what it is. Well, that's fine, because yeah. he's right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. We all discussed this off mm -hmm. the air. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Doug, uh, how do you know if we're training enough already? How do we know if our volume is where it needs to be? Or Save us. <laughs> I suppose the simplest answer is, are you making progress? Which means that you should be testing oh my something <laughs> and measuring your progress. Things should be changing in some ways that are discernible to you. That's right. <laughs> what, so, about, what, about my, what about using my Fran time? Uh, there's nothing wrong with using your Fran time. You, you just need to pick something you use it consistently. But today we're talking about strength specifically. You should so. probably pick something that you want to get better at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's your benchmark test. That way you know <laughs> if you're getting better at it. <laughs> don't, don't, pick right. a, don't pick a random benchmark wad and make that your benchmark for success when right. you're doing strength work. I've been work. squatting so much and this thing's not changing. <laughs> I'm squatting so much my Helen time didn't get better. That's Plus right. you don't squat tough. and Helen. Yeah, you don't need to pick Fran just because Fran is a CrossFit standard. You need to pick something that you you specifically need to get better at so or that you give a shit about like whatever yeah. matters to you human being yeah for strength i'd recommend picking one lower body lift so a squat a deadlift uh clean snatch pick one just one and then for upper body i would pick one type of pressing and one type of pulling so maybe pick weighted pull-ups cleans and strict overhead press or seated behind the neck press or something something that's Preach very that seated behind the neck press preacher curl i like okay. seated behind the neck press because it's it's very it's raw it's very hard to cheat 
you got to have a lot of mobility to do it at all. It's it's a it's a great test movement. Training it, maybe you shouldn't train it all the time. It might beat you up a little bit, but uh, we get, that's a whole other track. Now, but, that you, now you bring that up, I, I want to do that more often. Uh, it's a good test. Uh, since you and I can't do that, so. <laughs> A seated behind that press. Program him in there. That hurts so bad. So, uh, it's like, <laughs> we, should, we should get better at that. Wait, I can't press. But I really find You can't the, reach behind your neck. <laughs> so, I find the isolateral anymore. seated hammer press is really great. <laughs> <laughs> I can do those. I can do those. Of course you can because it sucks. It's stupid. You can also, you know, you can also shit and make Cheerio bowls. Right. So if, if, you, if, <laughs> if, if, if you, you're... I don't even know what that means. I just, I'm skipping bowls. past it. <laughs> bowls of Cheerios. So We have if, too if much coffee, man. Are the are the bowls made of Cheerios and <laughs> is that what we're talking In my about? dreams, they are. <laughs> <laughs> Think of it: a bowl that is made of Cheerio that contains Cheerios. Oh no! You went meta just then. <laughs> <laughs> So you know what that means? <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> that was a good old-fashioned derail so, job. So if you're tracking your progress, if, if you're if you're writing down what you do, if you if every Monday you do something, you know, five by five back squats, the first working set of five you get to, you're probably trying to hit a new five RM each week. So a common thing that you like to do or you, that you like to program is build up to a five rep max and then take 90% of that and do four more sets of five or something like yeah. that. So every week you're hitting a new five RM. If you're tracking your progress and writing down what you do every week, you should be able to see every week if you're hitting a new five RM, yeah, in even that if case, it's not a tester. In that case, I, I really encourage people to be conservative and going higher next each month. Sometimes I program that and people will go, they try to go for a 20 pound PR over the last weeks. Mm -hmm. Five hour round, I'm like, go for five pounds. Don't get crazy. You only got the rest of your life to get stronger, relax. <laughs> right, hey so, man, so it doesn't, doesn't have to be a one rep max necessarily. It can be a three rep max right. or five rep max, or you could pick the same weight you did last week and see if you can get six with it instead of five. Right. Or whatever you wanna do, whatever yeah, whatever you feel yeah. like you need to get better at, if you, if you can program that at least every four weeks, maybe every eight weeks, at the end of your deload week, test it, see if you got stronger, and then, then you can make some type of adjustment. And it might not even necessarily be more volume. More volume say, isn't the answer forever. You're not gonna go from five sets of five to six sets of five to 10 sets of five, 20 sets of five, 30 yeah. sets of five. My favorite way- That's what I'm talking add, about. I think that's what's gonna forever. happen, huh? <laughs> My favorite way of making progress right now, and it's such a, an obvious, beautiful thing, is actually to do, <clears throat> to go for the same weight or the same amount of work, like the same, th thing five sets of five squat or a heavy front squat single or a snatch but to do that to perform that rep uh more and more perfectly so move, do it better and better and, and more crisp and more crisp and also do it more and more in a relaxed state so more and more of a routine like the best lifters i was showing doug some lifters pre-game you know that's what we call the before the show period uh, this, this Russian guy Beristov this Russian guy 2004 champion but he lifts the hugest weights huge weights bro oh god the huge weights but he does it so calmly and so reserved like he'll put he'll do like a 200 kilo uh, push press triple and he'll, he'll drop it and he'll go yeah alright <laughs> but see when you do that when you get used to lifting if you can get used to lifting the thing that's heavy for you now in a routine way then once it's time to compete or once you know, your boys come over for a training session or once you go to a competition then the energy gets picked up you're expecting that for just a little bit more to be hard but then when all that energy hits because you get this huge reserve now you're so you have a surplus you can draw that out and you can really surprise yourself what you're capable of like when I go like if I train in the garage you get really really focused and really really reserved and get strong keep my strength but going to the gym man it makes for a really great workout so I think doing things more and more simply and more calmly is also a way to make progress. It's just an idea. Yeah, I mean, if, you're, if your snatch went up faster and smoother, that's progress. And, and it was it, easier for you to do. You no, know, I think a lot of times people get caught up in the weight, and basically what you're describing it is... It not be just more. You more know, is not your, the answer. Improve your finesse. Yeah. Be a ninja. <laughs> <laughs> so improve your finesse. Be a ninja. We, we need a t-shirt with that on it. <laughs> so how do you know maybe uh, you're doing too much? What if you're, what if you're maybe trying to bite off more than you can chew like what's a sure sign of that's happening how do you recognize that i don't know if you show up to the gym and the barbell feels heavy some days you show up and the barbell feels like nothing because it's basically nothing and some days you show up to the gym you pick up the bar and you're i mean like, if you're doug if, if, if you're doug the bar's like nothing but you know you came that's in right. whistling and you leave with your head hung low <laughs> yeah i mean some days the weights just they just feel heavier and yeah. some days the bar just seems to move effortlessly. But but even on some of those days where the bar feels heavier, I mean, I mm -hmm. find that some I've hit PRs on days where like as I'm warming up, I go, oh no, 
This is uh, really yeah. this is a st- this is a, scotch. This is that's a that's st- definitely st- true. Sticky you, situation, you, you know. Your body definitely can trick you. You feel like you're tired and you PR that day, and that does happen. But if you show up every day, and every day you're like, "Fuck, I have to train again," feeling like this. Yeah. Too many days in a row, it, it eventually will come to bite you. So, <laughs> if you feel like shit consistently, day after day after day. Not just one day where you come in and, and it feels heavy. Handy you, tip. You should only feel like shit <laughs> and then anchor it into the bowels of despair only some of the time. <laughs> That's right. Some of the time. Other times should be all right. But again, the real answer is, are you making progress? If, if the weights keep going up, then keep doing what you're doing. There's no need to make a change. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. That type of thing. So measure your results. If you're getting stronger, keep doing what you're doing. I think uh, also Chris brings this up. He's brought up a few times on the show, but I say we bring it up again. The canary in the coal mine. The canary in the coal mine. The jump test. Yeah. Could you you inform people of this test that you can perform (laughs) to see maybe today might not be the best day that you go crazy? Yeah. So the problem with strength is that if you're not getting weaker, that's a good sign. If you're getting stronger, it's a real good sign. But if you're not getting weaker, that doesn't mean you're not, you know, suffering or not recovering the way you should. And a a more sensitive way to test how things are going. You know, it's not definitive. Again, because sometimes you're going to be a little. Tired and fatigue, and that's okay. But in general, you can use things like a vertical jump as a metric, as a quick like temperature check for how you're doing. So if you find, you can easily measure your, your vertical jump. If you got something fancy like a digital pad, great. That measures the time you're off the pad and down. If you got just... That's the best way. You got a Vertec thing with little plastic things, you jump and hit, great. If you just have a mark on the wall, you put some chalk on your hand, you jump up and you slap it, and you can get higher or lower, and you just measure the difference. But if you see that going down... If it's just one, like, like they always make a point. If it's one transient thing, like I feel like shit and I don't jump as high, that's okay. Just make note. Plot it out in an Excel spreadsheet. Like put the inches up. How high'd you jump? And to make a little scatter plot. If you see it going down in time and all the strength things are staying the same, that, that's your sign that the overreaching is sort of settling in. And you're okay, but you might want to plan some rest. And yeah, if my, you see that going up, you're, then you're seeing the underlying fatigue coming and going like a wave, like a, like a tide in and out. So I think it's a great idea. Plot vertical jump. Just do that as you do whatever training you're doing, just as a way to objectively assess if you're getting better or not. Because if that's going up, you're getting more explosive and fast. The barbell Buddha barometer, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Whoa, man. But yeah, you can see you can see if your program is working by, if it's actually, it should go up and down, up and down, but trend up. If it's not, then something's wrong, man. And that's a very, that's the most sensitive way I think you can see that happening. I, I really like, like the that. The fitness and fatigue effect is a little sensitive By the way, way. that little pad that you, that, you know, uh, test the time and uh, time of flight. Mm-hmm. It's actually cheaper than a Vertec. Oh, so yeah. it's like people who buy Vertex. I'm like, what are you doing? Just buy that pad. That's way who easier, knows, man. It's way easier do. test. You know what we should do? The only thing I don't like, about, the only thing I like the Vertex for better is the fact that you're like trying to reach and hit a little bit higher than you did last time. So that's a benefit. I wouldn't be surprised. Mm-hmm. There's like an iPhone app for like holding your hand and jump and it could know how quickly you're coming up and down. Tape and the, give you tape, a reading. I heard if you tape, they have an app for that. You tape the the phone to the bottom of your shoe. And <laughs> <laughs> you do that. I had a hard pee there, sorry. I fucking cough, put coffee into the microphone. Yeah. Wear military boots, tape your phone underneath the boot. And then well, you've heard about someone tried to play a joke and they made an app for your iPad that's a scale. And you just... You no, stand on beautiful. your iPad and I'll tell you how much you look. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was another one too. Like it had it had something to do with like throwing it or something. Like you throw it and it would tell you something. How, <laughs> how far can you throw your iPad? Let's find out. <laughs> oh shit! This is a dumb idea. I get it now. <laughs> no, but I wouldn't be surprised if you could make that. Like, okay, I'm gonna hold my phone and jump. Oh, and it says you're fat. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. All right, so, so if more volume isn't the answer. <laughs> Did you leave what, Earth? What else can you change? Oh, sometimes, not- sometimes you might want to go with less volume, and you might want to change the intensity that you're training. And what I mean by that is the percentage of your one rep max. It, it might be more beneficial for you to do that. Another thing you can do is change the amount of time you're resting between sets. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, a lot of times you say, hey, rest three minutes between sets. Uh, right now, I've got a lot of the weightlifters. We're, we're in a little bit different phase of training. We're not, mm-hmm. we're not about to compete. Mm-hmm. Anytime soon, a lot of them are doing every minute on the minute lifts, you know, mm-hmm. which I so love. We're man. building fatigue, you know, it's density yeah. training. Is all density that is. training. Yeah. So even if you're, even if you're not changing the total volume, just switching up how you do the movements oh, yeah. might really help. So instead of doing three sets of five with a three minute break, maybe you do doubles every minute on the minute for eight, for seven or eight minutes. It's basically the same thing, but not quite the same thing and maybe your body reacts to that slightly different stimulus and you spur a little bit more progress yeah so for there's two there's two methods that i kind of like for changing that aren't the reps and sets type of thing 
Uh, one is the density training. And I like that for a more advanced athletes, somebody who has really good movement patterns already. Yeah, you got to be able to get tired and not have your form break down. Exactly. And then for the people who, you know, for the newer people, tempo uh, squats, tempo presses, doing tempo work is kind of the other way to do that. And that's, I like that better for newer people. And in fact, we still do tempo work, you know, pause squats, stuff like that. It's it's not just for new newer people, but I prefer that density training model more for change uh, for an advanced athlete but the tempo mm-hmm. uh, that's something like you know take four seconds on the way down pause for two seconds take you know come up as quickly as you can and so mm-hmm. you know you you have time for your down portion a time for the pause at the bottom a time for your up portion and then a pause at the top so you have mm-hmm. four different segments of time for your tempo mm-hmm. and this week you might do three seconds on the way down two second pause come up as quickly as you can one second pause at the top and then you could keep the same sets and reps for next week, but just, just change the time. tempo. Yeah, you can just mm-hmm. say, hey, four seconds we'll take four three. seconds on the way down this time. And so you can add volume over time, or you can make it raise the intensity <clears throat> by making the total time uh, with the tempo smaller and adding a little bit of weight. So those are a couple of I also, ways. I also like doing it within a set. So I, I've, I've done squats where I'll do, uh, you know, that, that speed rep weight kind of like, you know, maybe 75, 80 percent, no, heavy enough to be heavy, but not too heavy. And I'll do like two sets, two reps as fast as possible, like in a squat where I'm trying to get a good rebound and time it good. And then I'll do the third rep where I go down slower and pause and then come up explosive. So changing the, the, the tempo with even the same set. There's so endless mm-hmm. ways to play with it. Yeah. If you're if you're doing five by five and you end up plateauing after a while, you just said a second ago doing less volume. That doesn't mean you're working less hard. If you do right. five sets of three instead of five sets of five with heavier weight, you're doing less reps, but it might be potentially even a harder workout and you get even more benefit from doing five sets of three. And maybe I shouldn't throw this out there, but I'm going to. We didn't really mention it. Go, you're we, a rebel. We talked about volume and basically that's the amount of reps that you do in a workout or a week or a oh, month fuck. or whatever. We should have put that we should have put that at the beginning. Sorry guys. Yeah. How much you're doing. Sorry. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Well that's what it volume all clicks is. Now. Uh, yeah, we'll just put it at the beginning, go to the end first. No. And then uh but I want to mention volume load and that's the amount of reps you're doing uh, multiplied by the weight you're doing. So if you multiply that you're gonna get a better picture of how much work you're actually accomplishing. And so, you know, if you're doing less volume, but you increase the load, you could technically be doing more, a higher volume load total. And it's not the way it feels. Like you can feel like you did more work with like five by five, but if you did like 20 sets of two with more weight each each set, you may not feel as tired, but that's a lot more work done, you know? So we talked a lot about volume and that's a really a good way to to get into it. But eventually you're going to want to start looking at volume load as well. Maybe we'll do a whole other podcast on volume load. Yeah, volume they're, they're, load. <laughs> hardcore volume load episode. Yeah, the reality of it is that changing your training volume really is just one of many different things that you can change about your program to spur progress. So it might be one of the first things you start with, but after a while, you can't just do more. You have to do something else. And usually that means changing the exercises, the range of motion, the like the intensity, the speed. Something else can change besides just doing more reps. Man, now I, I I just can't get over the fact that we didn't uh, define volume on the front. At the, the very show. least, you can do the same thing. People are going to listen to the show and they have to go back and listen to it a second time if they didn't know what it was. Or, or they could listen to our other episodes where we talk about <sighs> training volume. <laughs> Great idea, Doug. <laughs> Thanks. I'm glad you thought uh, of that. <laughs> we had episode 44 and 54. Is that right? Yes. And we actually, talked about how to adjust your training volume yeah, 40, or how to adjust your diet for high volume training, I think was one of them too. Episode 54 was, yeah, adjusting your diet for higher volume training. So, you know, volume is not an isolated thing to change. If you change your volume, you might have to change your sleep and eating and all that kind of stuff. And we talk a little bit about that on episode 54. Yeah, I think one of the recommendations that maybe actually we didn't say this on, on that particular show, but uh, how we like to think about sleep with regard to training volume is that for the most part, every day you want to sleep roughly eight hours. And then for every training session you do that day, you want to add an hour of sleep. So if you train once that day, nine hours is more ideal. If you train twice a day, 10 hours is more ideal yeah. for that day. So that's that's an easy way to cycle your sleep with respect to your training. Way harder to do in reality than than to say just like that because life kind of gets in the way sometimes. Getting 10 I hours of sleep is slept, very unrealistic slept, for a lot of people. I slept two hours last Unless night. Unless you're trying to be a professional athlete. I slept athlete. five hours last night. Go. Awesome. Three hours the night before. 
Right on. I know. I woke up. But he was traveling a lot, folks. <laughs> yeah. I was flying back to Australia. I think everybody. I'm, I'm jet lagged as shit right now, actually. <laughs> I think everybody in this room probably gets a, a really good amount of sleep. People are surprised. Uh, I was at a conference. I actually don't know. I'm being fair. No, you probably don't. I get like two hours of sleep a night, really. <laughs> it sounds terrible. I get like nine. Do what we say, not what we do. I get like nine. And if I don't get nine, I, I know it. All right. We'll just we'll cut it off there. We'll see you next time. Enjoy talking to you folks about volume. <laughs> Is there anything we need to do? <laughs> talk about? Oh, yeah. Make sure to go to barbellshrug.com. Sign up for the newsletter. If you want information about stuff that's going on, places we're going. Uh, Way past strong, barbellbuddha.com. That's right. Chris's new, new book. New book is out, yeah. I wrote a book, man. A second book. This one's actually full length, a uh, 260 page piece. I think you'd like it. If you're interested, it's good. Can I tell people if they're interested where they would find it? Go for it. Uh, first, <laughs> do you remember? Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, yeah, you, you close your eyes and wiggle your nose in the mirror three times and say barbellbuddha.com. Uh, Amazon and Kindle version. So if you've got it, do me a favor, leave a like a little five star whatchamacallit. If you've read it, you can do that. Go online and, and, and leave a comment. I probably should. I should yeah. go on there and leave you, my I, review. Apparently you liked it, right? Are you being honest with me? Yes, I'm, it was very good. Thank you. I'm enjoying I'm it. I'm happy about that. Yeah. So Amazon, it's going to be on iTunes soon for the iPad. They just gotta, the Apple takes a long time to approve it. And of course you can get deluxe, a deluxe ebook and a deluxe paperback on my site at store.bible.com. But they're deluxe because I couple it with a little two hour video that's a, that's a supporting like bonus strength seminar. So it's pretty cool. We also, we also have the six month muscle gain challenge launching right now. You can go to moremuscle.barbellshrug.com if you want to check that out. That's a good idea. Oh, yeah. You should that. definitely what, do that. Sobia? If you want to get bigger and stronger. <laughs> Only if you want to get bigger and stronger. I mean, who wants that? Who wants if that's not your stronger. thing, don't worry about it. That's not just commercials. Like, Warning, this diet supplement is only for those in extreme need of weight loss. <laughs> or right. the, the, the ones for like, if you're in financial trouble, it's like, it's only for people who are in more than $20,000 in debt. You know, It's probably for anybody this who's It's only for debt. people who are really worried about their finances. <laughs> <laughs> Not you. No. That's right. All right, All right guys. thanks guys. See you next Cheers. time.